said at the beginning of this, 90% of my diet is fatty red meat. And when I cook two pounds of ground beef, the grease, the drippings, the just pure fat, I mix that up with the meat. I eat that too. I do not pour that off. Now, C-peptide is the next uh, bolded 1.79. Very happy with that. Now, my inflammatory markers, CRP, high sensitivity, 2.7, completely normal. And like I said, a CRP of 2.7? Don't love it. Yeah. Um, it is technically normal, under 3, but I suppose if you check a non-sensitivity or a non-sensitive CRP, then under 10 can be considered normal. Optimal is under one, and for some purposes, under 0 0.5 is considered optimal. Yeah, and there's a lot of reasons that this can be elevated, but if someone is in a you know, state of metabolic dysfunction, uh, metabolic syndrome, you'll very commonly see that above the level of one, even in the absence of something like a cold or a flu virus. Mm -hmm. IL-6, which is interleukin-6, a common cytokine, is one of uh, a, one of the main drivers of CRP. And you can certainly see that elevated. I said at the beginning of this, 90% of my diet is fatty red meat. And when I cook two pounds of ground beef, the grease, the drippings, the just pure fat, I mix that up with the meat. I eat that too. I do not pour that off. We've never drain drained ground beef in this house. Mm -mm. We eat the and fat. Here, I'll tell you why I don't. Because I'm lazy and yeah. it's a lot of work. And, and I don't keep mind well. it. Right. And, and it doesn't bother me at all. But I always thought it was. Yeah. I've never done that in my whole life just because I'm lazy. <laughs> and my, my DHEA was 89, which is still within normal limits. But that's a little lower than I would like for it to be. I'm not sure if, I, if I'll take a DHEA supplement for that or if I'll just try to tweak it with diet and exercise. It's Can you tweak DHEA with diet and exercise? I suppose there's some evidence that if you consume more carbs and your insulin goes up, that you could increase DHEA. Um, if his insulin is 0 0.9 or 1.5, which I assume it would probably be if there's no insulin resistance on a low-carb diet, generally insulins of below 6 are considered optimal in fasting. And for someone who's truly low carb, you would expect an insulin below three, especially if they're exercising consistently. Still within normal limits. So the next I'm not one is ESR, but it kind of splits the screen. So it okay, says so, ESR, but then the result is on the next page. Uh, I got page. you. So said right, 12. So again, here's a guy, 55 years of age, and you know, inflammation tends to increase as you get older. Eating a 90% fatty red meat diet and drinks the grease. No no sign of inflammation on the second marker. Ferritin normal, 368. Folate is low, quite a bit low. Pork and egg yolks. When we did this, I had been basically just living on beef, so I'm probably going to increase my egg yolks to get the folate back You've up. already been doing that. I have, Granted, yeah, this was yeah. in December, so it's, it's we've yeah. already been doing things for three months, yeah. so the next time we get our results, yeah. that will yeah. reflect the past. And then there's my gly glycated albumin that they messed up, but I don't need that because I have an A1C of 5.5. And remember my A1C at its highest. A1C of 5.5. What do we think about that? Perhaps in someone who's doing you know, several hours of exercise each day, that wouldn't be uh, an abnormal finding. You may see that as long as the insulin is quite low as well. I've seen that with insulins of like 1.7 or 2.2. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a different story if your insulin is six or above versus uh, one or two, and you have an A1C of 5.5, it's related to red blood cell turnover. If your red blood cell lifespan is abnormally shortened or prolonged, that will make A1C look inaccurate. So that's presumably why he got the glycated albumin. Now, more common test for that, especially with LabCorp, is fructosamine, which is just a, a different glycated particle. I did find it interesting that uh, he said his ferritin was normal in the upper 300s. Um, of note, since his CRP was elevated, then that ferritin does look a little higher than it actually is. So if his CRP was optimal or under 0 0.5, his ferritin would probably only be 320, 330. He's getting to the range where he should consider uh, phlebotomizing, especially if he is a HFE carrier. Yeah, which about 20% of people have at least one um, mutations, so they may be heterozygote at just one of those genes. Mm -hmm. 
to a 6.1 back when I was very pre-diabetic after I tried to follow the American Diabetes Association diet and it went from 5.7 to 6.1. So eating just... What does the American Diabetes Association recommend that you do as lifestyle interventions and diet and whatnot? I, if you follow their information, um, well, I guess, what does that mean? I don't know. We can look it up very quickly. Presumably, it includes consuming more carbohydrates than he is now. There's certainly plenty of health reasons to do ketogenic diets and low-carb diets. And that's one of the reasons why we enjoy talking yeah. with and collaborating with um, other physicians like Dr. Barry. But at the same time, um, I, I doubt that an A1C of 6.1 came from purely following the record. Yeah, the 2018 position statement, um, it was uh, published December 7th of 2018 and published in Diabetes Care, has quite a bit of information. Uh, perhaps we do a podcast just about this and talk about how good and bad or in between these recommendations are. Yeah, it looks like it emphasizes fruits and vegetables. Um, at least half of which are whole grains, not simple carbohydrates, low fat dairy, a variety of protein foods and oils, limiting saturated fat and trans fat, limiting added sugars and sodium. Hmm. Emphasizes plant-based foods, fish and seafood and olive oil as principal sources of fat. This is interesting. Protein in individuals with type 2 diabetes, ingested protein appears to increase insulin response without increasing plasma glucose concentrations. Therefore, carbohydrate sources high in protein should be avoided when trying to treat or prevent hypoglycemia. Hmm, interesting. So they're trying to prevent or treat hypoglycemia in a type 2 diabetic. Uh, it's almost like they would probably be on some sort of medication, which you might need to alter in order to prevent that as well. Yeah, that would be a more sophisticated approach for sure. Mm -hmm. Anyway, back to the labs. Just meat and eggs, it's 5.5, which I'm very happy with. And my total insulin is 7.0. So well under 10, and I'd, I'd like for it to be five, but I'm happy with it being a seven. Of course, I'm, my iron's going to be normal because I eat all the red meats. And now the lipid panel. Non-HDL cholesterol high at 201. <laughs> LDL particle number high at 2867. LDL small, 354 high. Total So even the particle numbers and the small particles of LDL mm -hmm. are flagged as high. And if you're a proponent of the um, lipid particle size hypothesis, I guess that's a hypothesis at this point, um, which I know is still debated, but they would propose that it's the small particles that are in fact atherogenic, the large fluffy particles, perhaps due to the electric charge or due to the size that it's not as likely to slip into the subendothelial space. Um, but if you're trying to make the case of like, oh, I've got a low-risk phenotype if you look at my particle size. Certainly not doing that with this set of blood work. Yeah, I wouldn't want to bet um, one of the most common causes of death on my particle size. I'd probably want um, definitive evaluation like a CCTA with plaque analysis in order to do so, especially if I was 55. You probably haven't lived long enough to accrue a significant amount of calcified plaque. Yeah, calcium score could provide a false sense of reassurance. That seems to be a popular thing in the in many different health communities, but carnivore community, uh, checking calcium score. Oh, I'm 30 years old. It's zero. My mm -hmm. diet is therefore the optimal diet. Cholesterol 255, which is high. But now, remember the last time I got my total cholesterol, it was 350. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it was 354, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's my total cholesterol has fallen 100 points in how many years of carnivore? Four years? Four, I yeah. think four years ago, I got them. I'm, I'm, ter I'm a terrible patient. It was about four years. Yeah, ago. yeah. Uh, if you really want to know if your diet's working, you probably do want to get labs more often than every four years, maybe every four to six months, something like that. Um, but props for actually 
putting up the lab results. Uh, we did this recently in a podcast. If you want to see our labs, you can go check that out. We'll link to that in the show notes. Um, but yeah, we do like to see people displaying a level of transparency where they bring the data to back up their approach to health. Certainly. Yeah. I think that he does a great job of that. And I think he has best interest of others at heart, but perhaps he is a bit biased towards his carnivore diet, which uh, has subjectively worked well for him thus far. HDL cholesterol 54. Now I'll tell you, I'm one of those guys that I could used to never get my HDL into the 40s. It was always 30 something, multiple, multiple times, even when I was a younger man. This is from fatty red meat and this is from lifting heavy things on the farm. That's what did that. And also I don't filter my coffee. We have an espresso and that's what I drink. It's not filtered. And so I could probably get that a little bit, even a little higher if I started filtering. That's a whole nother video. Everybody's going to be yeah. like, what do you mean Wait, by what? This? I've got a video on my channel if you want to check it out. Yeah. And then my triglycerides. When I was first diagnosed with prediabetes, it, they were 300 and something. There's now 60. Were they really? Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. The LDL medium and large. The medium is the ones that are high. Large is, is normal. And I have a pattern A. And then my ApoB, apolipoprotein B, is high. And my LP little a is high. So according to Dr. Atia and Dr. I think LPA is 86. Animals per liter? Yep. That's Animals not too bad. Per liter. Yeah. So it's just borderline. And interestingly, you know, taking something like uh, aspirin might push that into a quote unquote normal range. Yeah, in some cases. Dr. Lipid, all these these Dr. guys, Lipid? that's his Twitter oh, handle. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I, I can't think of his actual name, but that's his handle. I'm going to die any minute, according to that. But I've looked into these tests extensively there's in my opinion still experimental and i predict that over the next few years they'll fall by the wayside and people won't even talk about them anymore. also he is going to get a cac but yes. the so do you think lpa is just another fad no this is definitely not going by the wayside now there's a difference between having an lp little a of 400 animals per liter and having an lp little a of 85 animals per liter even though both are high but it's here to stay. Yeah, and I, I think it's a little bit of a mischaracterization of what lipidologists are actually saying. I've, I've never heard Tom Dayspring tell someone that if they have a high LPA, they're going to die immediately. Yeah, um, all this is saying is whatever risk category you think you're in, you should stratify to a slightly higher risk category. And I think he said CAC here. So let's see what they have to say about that. The machine was down or they couldn't get us in something. So we're going to have to go back and do that on another day. But yes, we are. Going to, well, I, I don't think I'm going to get it done. But he is going to get it fun. done. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah, too. it takes five minutes. Yeah, but I'm going to get a CAC. And then if it's not zero, then I'm going to get a, a carotid artery intimal thickness. Maybe get a CT angiogram, depending on what my I CAC score is. we should have all the tests. He said, if it's not zero, or did he mean if it is zero, I'll get a CCTA, which is a coronary angiogram. He said, if it's not zero. If it's not zero. So if it's zero and it is fairly likely a false negative zero, then he doesn't want any further evaluation whatsoever. I have a hard time understanding it. The, <sighs> if presumably he is, was very unhealthy in the past, pre-diabetes, you know, we see him sedentary, these sort of risk factors, yep. blood pressure was probably elevated. Fasting insulin still high. Yeah. Then you would think all of these things, especially in the context of elevated LDL lipoproteins, elevated ApoB, elevated LP little a, that you would want the most sensitive test, not one that's sort of a lagging indicator. Yeah. I see no reason not to just start with a carotid ultrasound and a CCTA with plaque analysis. And even if it says no clinically significant plaque, then send it off to heart flow and or clearly. Both are great ways to analyze plaque. Or make the radiologist do their job and tell them, hey, I'd like a, a CADRAD score per the standard of care. Or both. Um, and for public benefit, he may as well still get clearly your heart flow so that people know that those options are out there. Yeah. And again, we don't get paid what we lose money by doing clearly in heart flows on patients, lose significant money. So uh, yeah, we're certainly not paid by them. Um, but we just don't like to 
see people die from one of the most common causes of death. And most preventable. Yep. Yeah, I do too, without getting too much radiation. Yep. Well, no, yeah. Obviously. Okay, next page. Is that not the same? It's a repeat, but then oh. we got to go down, yeah. Okay, so some of it is repeated at the yeah. top. So skip down to phosphorus, which was normal. Then my prostate-specific antigen, 55 years of age, so I need to check that, normal at 2.02. .02. All of my thyroid stuff was normal. I'm not concerned about that. I've never had any problems never with thyroid. Problem. Now down to the testosterone uh, panel, sex hormone 50.3. Free testosterone, 74, uh, bioavailable, 153, and total testosterone, 750. And as a 55-year-old, I'm happy with, with all that. I don't have any. Pretty solid number. Total of 750, sec from binding globulin of 50. That probably puts him slightly below the 50th percentile in terms of the free testosterone if you calculate it out. Mm -hmm. But if you were feeling good, not symptomatic with that, that's a pretty top-notch testosterone level. Yeah, not too bad. Um, Again, you can calculate your free testosterone from the total and the SHBG, the, um, you know, whatever amino assay they did for free testosterone here, presumably it's not the equilibrium dialysis or equilibrium ultrafiltration is not accurate. So, um, yeah, if somebody wants to calculate in what his actual free testosterone is and let them know, feel free to do so in the comments. Any worries or concerns with that? Normal vitamin B1, which is thiamine, is normal. And then there's my thyroid antibodies. They're normal. Total iron binding capacity, normal. Transferrin, normal. And then TSH. I don't know why they don't just put all the thyroid labs. Now, another very important marker for me, tumor necrosis factor alpha, a, a marker of inflammation. The high sensitivity one, completely normal. Eating a 90% fatty red meat diet and drinking the grease, no sign of inflammation. Does that mean 90% of his calories are from fat or 90% of his food is fatty red meat? 90% of his food is red meat. Okay, so the latter. Yeah, so 90% uh, red meat carnivore, if you will. And I'd much rather see a TMAO, especially with the slightly elevated CRP, than uh, a TNF alpha or whatever other markers he's going to check. Yeah, and the, the cytokine and inflammasome panels, they're not really looked at as intervention. So the, the CRP number actually comes from your cardiac risk. So you'll see it say like low risk, average risk, or high risk. Yeah. And that's established based on patients who already have cardiovascular disease. Maybe mm -hmm. they've already had an event and you're looking at what is their risk of a future event. So it, it, I think it was 2.5 something, not far off from that high risk category. Again, mm -hmm. I don't believe he's had a cardiac event, um, but all things equal, you'd rather have that below one. Yeah, we could always host a CME class called Clinically Significant Metabolomics and Inflammasome. Um, I'm triggered. Learning. So you pay, <laughs> you know, $1,000, and then on the first page it just says, there is no clinically significant in, like, Inflammasome takeaways or Now I'm untriggered. And then it says, you may have paid us $1,000, but we said you've all that time that you could have spent looking into this come back in three to five years and pay another thousand dollars and we'll let you know if it's changed. It's worth it, worth the time savings. Whatsoever. And then my urinalysis and my urine ketones were okay. trace. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's the urine bill. Oh, yeah, yeah, trace. You're right, right. So I barely had, and I'd been fasting for 16, 18 hours. Much longer than I had. 16 to 18 hours and fasting insulin was still at seven. Yeah, that's, somewhat concerning that he is still insulin resistant despite consuming almost no carbohydrates. It's and impressive. no calories for 16 to 18 hours. If you tend to get hypertriglyceridemia, most of your LPIR scores will tend to be higher and you will tend to get insulin resistance more from lipids. Yeah. I think I was fasted maybe 14 hours, maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so, again, urine ketone dipsticks, not accurate. Don't use those to gauge your keto if you're a keto. Your Color of your <clears throat> urine. Yep. Yellow. Yeah, it was yellow. <laughs> uh, that's And the rest, that's a repeat. So, down to uric acid, completely normal. Urine microscopy. My B12 was 590. So, you notice neither Anisha nor I have really super high. B12. There's a normal distribution curve for the, all this stuff. And there are some people when they're eating the same carnivore diet that I'm eating, they'll have a vitamin B12 of 1200. It's just the way your genes and your, and your epigenetics are working. Oh my gosh, your B6 yeah, my, level. Yeah, my B6 level is, is high. substantially high. 
So I have no deficiency of vitamin B6. <laughs> and I, I'm not concerned with this B6 level. I'm not taking any supplements. No. I'm just eating human food. And so that's what my body chose to do with that. And I'm not concerned about that at all. My vitamin D25, 47, a little higher than yours, but still not where I would like for it to be. Well, Again, I, we've medical got to remember lab. to take our damn vitamin D. I know, D. I know, I know. <laughs> Listen, doctor and nurses are the worst patients. We are, okay? absolutely. Next page, insulin like. Why well, doesn't it just take 50,000, you know, once a week for a couple of weeks? He'll be at 90 before he knows it. Vitamin D, yeah, that, you don't even have to remember to take it. Yeah, it's got soluble. Bolus, just take bigger doses. Yeah, bolus dosing once a week or even every couple of weeks. Yep. It's a lot of pills, but you can do it that way if people do have a trouble or a hard time with adherence. Yeah, tiny you soft even, gels. You could even go into uh, a med spa and get a vitamin D3 injection. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> the growth factor because of the nerd on Twitter. There's that, normal at 169. And then uh, this niacin B3, uh, this is like a smoking test. I think they ordered the wrong test. Here. Oh, well. yeah, this is not helpful at all. I'm not sure. And then my zinc, normal. Uh, even though I eat virtually zero plants, my zinc was fine. And then plants, zinc. What did he mean? Clams or oysters? I don't know. It didn't make sense. Anyway, we can, we can move on. <laughs> one more page. Yeah, I think one or two, two more. Okay. okay, copper. The reason I wanted to get copper was because I eat quite a bit of cod liver and chicken liver. And there are so many people out there like, oh, you'll get copper toxicity if you eat liver. No, no, completely normal on the lower range of normal. He eats a lot. I probably eat liver, liver two or three times a week. No sign of copper toxicity. This is usually on the lower range of normal. Um, when they made this reference range, we don't know if they included women on hormonal contraceptives or not, because essentially all um, oral contraceptives and uh, intrauterine contraceptives are going to increase serum copper significantly. Yeah, and I believe Dr. Andy Galp had pointed out not too long ago that the serum copper levels, which I don't think this was intracellular, but serum yeah. copper levels tend to be on the lower end of the range yes. in men, uh, especially if they have a little bit more muscle mass. And I, I think Dr. Berry does engage in some at least physical exercise, lifting heavy things on the farm, like he says. Mm -hmm. So he probably has a little bit more muscle mass than the average person from the Inhanes database if they're pulling from there. Yeah. Whatsoever, there's my cortisol. Just checking one like that is not helpful at all. You have to check them multiple times over the course of the day. Now my heavy metals, completely normal. No sign of heavy metal poisoning, despite all the stuff you hear about, oh, meat's full of toxins and antibiotics and hormones and heavy metals. No, no sign of that at all. Homocysteine. Barely high, 15.2, so two-tenths of a point higher than normal. I'm not especially concerned about this. Uh, there's multiple reasons that could be slightly elevated. I'm not worried about that at all. Now, yeah. like high methionine content in the diet? <laughs> yeah, I, I probably wouldn't make too much of a single homocysteine level. Um, checking a couple of them or empirically supplementing with you know, B-complex, methylated B vitamins or some trimethylglycine could be reasonable, but depending on how long it sat um, unrefrigerated or before it was processed, yep. then that can affect how accurate that homocysteine is. I believe if APTT is also off, that homocysteine tends to be off as well. Yeah. From, from the labs that we've seen where things that are affected by time, temperature, and lysine, um, those usually are off. Yeah, so if you see a, a one-off homocysteine that doesn't make sense, just recheck it. You don't need to panic and pay Gary Brecka lots of money. Interleukin-6, another marker of inflammation, completely normal. No sign of inflammation in this red meat eater. My magnesium, uh, RBC, RBC magnesium, completely normal. And now my... Since he said interleukin-6, um, we should point out that that is highly transient because he's pointed out that a lot of other things are transient. Um, IL-6 can spike extremely high and then be detected low just yeah. hours later. If I, if I went and did a heavy, high-intensity interval training workout, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, my IL-6, I know locally would be high. Probably in the serum, you would see that as well. Yep. Or the day after someone runs a marathon, right? You're going to have high inflammasome, right? You're going to look like the most inflamed person on earth. 
omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid profile. EPA 0.4, DHA 1.3. My omega-3 index is high, once again. And then my omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, 12. Uh, almost exactly the same as Nisha's, which I would like for it to be a little better than that, but I'm not especially worried. Rachidonic acid, which is a great anti-inflammatory, antioxidant in the body, completely normal. And then last page, selenium. And I haven't eaten a Brazil nut in 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> selenium is is r right in the middle of normal. Looks great. Vitamin B2, completely normal. My vitamin C is also low. It's the same, isn't it? Your, I think yours same. was 12. Oh, and mine it? was 10. Okay. So we're both low. Now, how often do I get injured working out in the woods? Every single day. And how many days does it take a big scratch? I mean, heal. it's hard to tell because there's new ones every day, to be <laughs> honest. But, I mean, his leg's not falling off, so I think that probably... <laughs> I thought he was going to be talking about connective tissue there for a second. Like how often Call do I get cross injured? Linking. Yeah. yeah. And she's like every single so day. And I was like, oh, there's your answer. But no, talking about scratches. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I hear a lot of zero water soluble vitamins. Yeah. doesn't say a lot. Yeah. A lot of the carnivores will say this and you know, seemingly are able to train and heal without the vitamin C in there. Does it mean it's the smartest thing to do or the best approach to health? Yeah. Probably I, not. Ironically, if if he is thinking about this, I think he said his transferrin or iron saturation was normal. But if it is higher and he, if he is an HFE carrier, then the lower vitamin C in the diet might be helping him not absorb as much iron. So there might actually be therapeutic benefit to not supplementing with vitamin That's C. That's fair. Yeah. That'd be an interesting yeah. uh, sort of trial for Unin him to do. Unintended benefit. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I think that's the last page. We'll see if they have anything else. Right, but she's actually comedy before. Where's that big scratch that was on your leg like three days ago, and it's already healed and gone? So no bleeding gums, uh, no signs of scurvy, no no problems with wound healing. So I'm not concerned about that. A lot of people would say, "Oh my God, you need a vitamin C supplement." Also, like vitamin C can be found in tomatoes and things uh, that I uh, eat, so it's not even yeah, like a even our pepper. heart levels are very similar, mm -hmm. and I actually eat things with vitamin C in them. So right, right. Now I'll tell you guys, when I got my labs checked four years ago, I had been a carnivore for a year or two, and my vitamin C was normal. But now it's it's significantly low, but I'm having no signs of scurvy is everybody saying they have scurvy because their vitamin c is low and well, not a lot of doctors have a lot of doctors if they see this they'll say oh my god you, you got scurvy. scurvy they'll say that yeah huh it, it, completely ignoring that there's a a list of well-known symptoms that go along signs and symptoms of scurvy and if you don't have any of those then it's impossible that you have scurvy and then my vitamin e completely normal uh did we not get iodine checked is was that the one one of the ones that didn't well you in order to really check an iodine you've got to do a 24-hour urine collection. oh right we talked yeah. about that yeah. okay yeah. so it was that's actually a good point to yeah. uh, gauge the iodine status correct uh serum iodine is usually looking for toxicity mm -hmm. Um, urine iodine is actually a better marker of your true iodine status. Yep. And a lot of functional yeah. medicine clinicians won't know that. Yeah. If you, if you mention that a single serum iodine is not a great way to check total body status, you have to mention a single serum vitamin C is not a good way to check vitamin C status. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't pick and choose. You gotta, um, you have to be cognizant of which nutrients are, um, going to be more difficult to assess your total body store. What he said about scurvy is absolutely right. It is a, a clinical diagnosis based off signs and symptoms, not just a serum vitamin C. Yeah. I, I may be a little bit misleading to say that lots of doctors would look at that and say, oh, you've got scurvy. Like if he went into you know, his average traditional medical doctor that would probably be much more concerned about the lipoprotein picture mm -hmm. than this vitamin C that Really, I don't think anybody ever orders. Yeah, I think that's a good summary. Um, yeah. So he's made some good strides in his health, it sounds like, over the last mm -hmm. five or six years. Um, he's found that in the carnivore diet, and he's on this path that uh, may lead him to some harm reduction or risk mitigation. So he's Certainly. sort of chosen this dietary strategy. And if there's evidence that, hey, it looks like this or something has led to some plaque accumulation, mm -hmm. It'll be interesting to see what um, what changes he decides to implement. Yeah, his total lifestyle is healthier now than it was in the past. There's pros and cons to every diet. And this is a good, you know, again, a good example of 
why a diet that you and I might not never might not ever do works quite well for someone else. And he is a, uh, like I said, very kind and nice individual. We co-posted a, a post with Nick Norwitz before that had good interaction. So uh, hopefully he does watch this video and has some good takeaways. If he's not familiar with ordering a CCTA in or plaque analysis via Clearly or HeartFlow, we would love to do so. Um, again, because even if he has, you know, a 70% stenosis and it needs to get a fractional flow reserve tested, then it doesn't necessarily mean that the high ApoB and LP little a um, caused that entirely during the carnivore diet. Perhaps a lot of the damage was done before. So a lot of times uh, people can kind of have a free pass or an out um, if they get those results back that are a bit surprising, even after a calcium score of zero. We have certainly seen it, calcium scores of zero, soft black stenoses of greater than 70%. Yeah, so regardless of his CAC, I hope he does get a CT angiogram. He mentioned something about radiation. So if he is concerned about that exposure, I would just go ahead and do the CCTA. Um, that would make more sense to me. It's the more sensitive test. And you get a calcium score with that. Correct. If that's a, you know, a metric or a number that he's wanting. But, uh, I mean, relative to the general population, he is much more metabolically healthy than them. Although I, I don't think he's quite yet at that pristine uh, metabolic health level yet. Yeah. Yeah. I certainly agree. And hopefully that provides, um, everyone with some good clinical takeaways. After all, we're just trying to give tools to develop a balanced approach for health, not tell people to do this or not to do this. Um, you know, this is a little bit of a benevolent clickbait, if you will, to stir up some fake controversy in order for people to learn more about, um, their unique self. Yeah. Absolutely. So we hope you liked the video. Um, if you did, let us know. If you didn't, let us know in the comments. But as always, we thank you for your time and may God bless you with health and happiness. Mm -hmm.